Good afternoon. My name is Lan Snell. Welcome to Macquarie Business School and welcome to the Global MBA webinar. This special webinar that we're bringing to you tonight is going to focus the discussion on the performance track. Uh, clearly, there's been a number of questions um, that we have received from prospective students about what this means, um, about questions relating to the open courses versus the closed, questions relating to the actual academic achievement that you need to uh, attain for you to actually transfer over to the, um, into the degree program. We hope to cover all those common questions tonight. So again, welcome to um, our webinar. It is 5 p.m. in we're broadcasting live from Sydney, Australia. I am the Academic Program Director for the Global MBA and it's been a really exciting year. Before I go into um, and open it up officially, let me introduce um, our very special guests. We have two students um, that are uh, with the Global MBA joining us tonight so that you can hear from them what their experience has been to date. And what I'm going to ask them to do is ask them to introduce themselves briefly and then we'll move into the presentation. So Nandita, would you mind opening it up by introducing yourself briefly to the group? Um, hi everyone, I'm Nandita Alva. Um, I work in um, the financial services industry in Australia um, and this is my second course within the Global MBA pro program and I've joined via the performance track. I've had a great experience so far which is why I'm here and I want to talk to you about it. Um, and over the course of this presentation today I'll be answering more questions so feel free to ask whatever you need to in order to clarify your doubts. Thank you. Thanks, Nandita. And G House, um, dialing in from Melbourne. Yes, hi everyone. My name is G House. Um, I'm from Melbourne. I work as an enterprise architect uh, within the state government agency in Victoria. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you, Len, for inviting me in. We're looking forward to all your questions. Thanks very much, G House. Just also before we continue, a bit of housekeeping on how we can interact. We are, um, I strongly encourage as many questions and as many comments that you may have along the way. We'll do our absolute best to address every one of them. Um, so feel free to enter those comments in um, the comment box. Um, you can also raise your hand and we'll try and pause and, and get to you as, as we go through. We are expecting approximately 130 people um, have registered for this webinar. This will be recorded as well and we'll send it to uh, everyone that's actually registered, whether you're able to attend in person or access the recording. So I'm just going to now move on to the slide deck. When we talk about the Global MBA, I'd like to... Um, I think it's really important to say that it is a very new, very disruptive program. It went live this year in 2019. So um, when we talk about how it's new, we talk about, I often talk about it's re-engineered. We've actually remade the MBA because we've listened very carefully to what industry expectations are. We know that there's been a number of significant shifts in the labor market. We know that the burning platform for change is very real. Um, when we consider the discourse on the future of work and the future of learning, and we see the shifts that organizations are undertaking, when we also factor in the pipeline in terms of the labor market now, really consisting of four different generations, all these represent amazing changes and challenges to organizations. And it does affect how organizations are structured. It also affects how we as workers work and also the nature of work itself. And so therefore, because of those dynamic changes that are constant, they're not going away anywhere anytime soon, we need to adapt ourselves to that. When I say we, I'm talking about how we as learning providers adjust our learning options to really suit this very disaggregated labour market. And so hence, every business school, every university is entertaining these set of challenges. So this is no different. The difference is our response to it. So um, because we're pretty methodical, because we at Macquarie Business School do our research and our homework, and because we believe that the most effective way to re-engineer an MBA is asking our end buyer what their expectation is, and that end buyer is called industry. 
we listen to them and uh, we've actually incorporated those design principles in it. So we come up with three main value propositions that I believe really capture the essence of the Global MBA. They include a future focus capabilities focus um, in terms of curriculum build. They include a stackable model, which allows for um, the learner, the student to take on as much or as little, little as they want. And of course, a third component is inclusive through it being very affordable. So when we talk about three value propositions, the curriculum is future focused, the model is stackable, and the actual pricing is very affordable, meaning that it's very inclusive. I do think that that, that is an important element because what we have seen is a spectacular failure of leadership across the board. When we look at our political leaders, when we look at even in Australia, um, you know, and I have no joy in saying this, is that another bank has been found to be acting in a very unethical manner. So the trust has been broken. Perhaps we might need to rethink what leadership looks like for the future. And this is where I think we need to broaden that pool of talent there so that it is a lot more inclusive to, um, to factor in different shapes and different leadership types. Um, if we consider the bell curve, I, I think the traditional MBA and where they have been positioned in the marketplace because they've been so um, um, expensive, elite, it, that could only really attract two and a half percent of the population. And so our, our price point at 33,000 Australian dollars or 20,000 US dollars means it's a very different inclusive uh, pool of talent that we can actually pull in. So I want to leave you with that. When we think about the globe, when we're the MBA, we think about its future focused capabilities, it's stackable and affordable. Let's move on now to some other elements. I'd mentioned earlier about our advisory board and I was saying to Nandita and G House um, about today we ran our last industry advisory board for the year. We engage with them on a quarterly basis and it's really important to get their ongoing input because they are basically co-creating that curriculum with us. Today, the focus of the discussion where we really sought their input was around our problem solving capstone. And I'm pleased to say that the reception that we got from that in terms of the learning outcomes, the assessment type, um, and how we actually built out that uh, uh, the four units within the capstone has been really well received by industry. Um, so this is our board. Um, it consists of a number of different professionals and deliberately cross-sectional and deliberately uh, representing different functions within organisations. We have large, medium, small and startup, micro startups represented here. Again, that's very deliberate. And I hope one of the first things that you pull from this picture is the diverse element of this board composition. Again, a very deliberate recipe to make sure that we get um, a set of different lenses to the discussion. Okay, I'm going to jump into the curriculum, but before I do, just a quick pause out there and a check in with, say, G House. I mean, at this point in time, G House, when I talk about the value proposition of the Global MBA, I mean, how much of that was really important for you when you were considering your MBA? Yeah, thanks, Len. Look, my, my journey for um, during higher education, I really started in early 2018. Um, at, at, at that time, I was working as a solution architect for a government agency. I was there in the role for five years. Um, later on in the year, I got promoted to enterprise architect and have been enrolled since then. But in early 2018, what became very clear to me was the skills, the knowledge, and the experience that brought me here wouldn't take me to the next level. If I had to progress, I can either sit idle and let my hair get gray, or I can do something transformational and get some higher education degree. So I started looking around. Because I was working for a government agency, my natural inclination was to pursue higher education in public administration. But then I found that the cohort there is probably close to twice my age at a different level. And also I was not sure if I wanted to fix myself doing public service work for the rest of my life. So then I started to look at the natural alternative there was an MBA. So hence I did some research into MBA programs in Australia and actually applied for a very prestigious university in Australia, went through an exhaustive and scrutinized application process to get, get in and got the offer. At the same time, to fill in my commute time, I subscribed to Coursera, which is the platform that we use for MBA and 
an email came to me that Macquarie University has announced that they're going to launch a GMBA program in May. And, and I had a look into it, and the value proposition was just too hard to ignore. You know, it had the same level of ranking of the ranking that I applied the university for, the same or similar or much advanced curriculum, I must admit, and at a very attractive price. So then I decided to defer my enrollment at that university and eventually withdraw and then enroll into this GMBA program and I have not been disappointed so far. It's been an amazing journey so far. Thank you very much, G House, for sharing that sort of consideration set, because I know that we know from our research that prospective students spend anywhere between six to 12, sometimes 18 months in thinking about that commitment, because it is a significant commitment. We're not just talking about the financial commitment, but we're talking about the time commitment. And invariably, we are all working professionals. Well, in fact, 100% of our current cohort are all working professionals. So the average age is about 38, with the average number of years of working experience at management or leadership level is 13 years. That signals a lot in terms of how busy we are, um, let alone with family obligations or care obligations, travel commitments with work make it increasingly difficult for us to commit to then coming onto campus to pursue further education. We know that that is a pain point out there. So obviously we're looking at different ways of delivery mode to address that need of flexibility. The other thing I like, um, I heard you mention uh, G House in your consideration set was rankings. And I haven't mentioned that in, until now. And I think that is also very important because what that does signal is quality in terms of reputation. Uh, it also signals how well um, regarded the MBA or the business school is from an industry perspective. So I think when you are considering investing your time and money into a program, you really want a return on investment. So I always advise prospective students to really do factor in rankings. I mean, it is one proxy indicator of a quality of the business school. Thankfully, Macquarie Business School is uh, within the Australian tertiary market. There are about 40 providers. We are ranked in the top three. So those can include AGSM, which is the Australian Graduate School of Management, which is a business school within um, the University of New South Wales. There is us and there is also Melbourne Business School. We all jostle to be within that top three. Um, worldwide, our Financial Times rankings come, uh, we come in at number 74 globally out of hundreds of business schools. So that gives you an indication of where we are ranked globally and also within Australia. Australia is important when we talk about the quality of con uh, qu quality um, framework because in Australia, unlike the rest of the world, it's a very rigorous process. Um, and um, it is the, Australia's third largest export sector. So it's about $34 billion industry. And um, when people, one of the first things that people mentioned to me when we talk about um, innovative models of learning for the future and the global MBA, one of the first things they mentioned to me is, oh, well, look, online learning and online MBA must be poor in quality. I will always respond by saying that we make no excuses, we'll make no compromises. Quality is always going to be throughout every offering that we have in terms of our curriculum, in terms of the faculty that's delivering into, into the program, and in terms of our cohort that's coming in. No compromises because we will not even risk our reputation on that one. So I hope that assures you in terms of what this product is all about. Um, I will have to agree, however, with the common perception of online learning at large, and that is genuinely negatively perceived. And the reason why it is negatively received is because a lot of online products out there are pretty poor, are pretty ordinary. And so when I ask you to consider what makes a quality program, look at rankings is one indication, look at the quality of the program in terms of the curriculum, look at who uh, the business school is interacting with and how well they're collaborating with external stakeholders, including industry. And when I say including, because most business schools don't actually include industry. Uh, we work in partnership with industry all the way through. So it's a very co-created approach. And also in terms of how innovative this is to address uh, the pain points of um, our students who are looking for 
true flexibility. So there are some quality indicators for you to consider as you think about which MBA is for you. You're lucky because we've kind of done our homework for you. And what, what, what I'd like to do tonight in, with the help of Nandita and G House is share with you our research findings and our experience in this space. So let me now just now turn quickly to um, the actual curriculum. And that is, I talked about earlier, our first value proposition about our uh, future focus capabilities. How we present the curriculum here, it is all mapped against the research findings. We consulted, I guess, uh, um, three main reports. The World Economic Forum is our first basis that we look at. And this looks, this actually identified 16 um, skills that were considered to be adaptable skills necessary for us to be agile and compete in the future labour market. Um, the other sources came from Deloitte and then again has been most recently um, reconfirmed by um, an IBM report that was just released two months ago, identifying the shifts in terms of the technical skills and the adapting or the soft skills that are required for to achieve uh, the new collar. They actually frame it as a new collar. This is all about developing how um, our uh, ability to adapt to problem solving and to work in different uh, projects and to work in different teams. Based on that, this is our curriculum. It is clustered into six capability areas or specializations, if you will. So strategizing is one, leading, analyzing, influencing, adapting, and problem solving. You will note that the language immediately is different to probably any other MBA program out there. And I encourage you to actually make this comparison when you're doing your homework, comparing the different MBA offerings. One of the first things that you will notice is that the language we use is very much outcomes focused. This should map very closely with the KPIs of performance that is expected of the experienced tyres market. Um, and the reason why I'm comp so confident when I say this is because we mapped it to a number of our partners as well in terms of what they are assessing and um, performance managing their staff against. So for example, when we talk about um, strategic thinking, well, we are, we're talking about the ability to develop, be competitive in our mindset, to be global in our outlook that looks at supply chain to be disruptive, disruptive in thinking about innovative solutions and how we might um, bring about efficiencies, not just from cost saving efficiencies, but also front end in terms of creating truly innovative solutions and be sustainable. And here we're talking about how we might um, incorporate circular um, economy principles in looking at how, uh, how our business is going to sustain and grow and evolve in the future as well. So that completes the strategizing component. Then when we look at leading, this is all about our ability to harness, to um, address the pain point in uh, how we might attract, retain and grow our talent. And so this is about knowing our people. How well do we know our people? How well do we know our organisation? This is the holy trinity here. So it's about people, process and technology and alignment thereof. Understanding what your leadership style is just tapping into what I said earlier about the spectacular leadership failures. Here we are challenging people's understanding of what the predominant leadership um, traits are and perhaps how we might examine which one is more appropriate under which circumstances and depending on what type of organisation you're in. What I'm talking about here is um, understanding that there are different, so there are transformational leaders, servant leaders, instructional leaders, et cetera which leader are you and which leadership type is best for a different organisation. The last one in the leading uh, capability set is what we call become a meaning maker. And this is really an interdisciplinary sort of a unit. This combines role theory or social theory, which is typical of the management discipline with that of how organisations manifest meaning through brands and meaning. I'm going to pause at this point here and ask Nandita. Nandita, have you have you done any uh, any of these eight units so far in your journey? No, sorry, Lan, I haven't. Um, I've only done two from influencing. Um, Great. Which so one? Far. Which one did they? So we'll I've, jump to I've done ma manage change mm -hmm. and uh, engage the board. And tell me what your thoughts about those two units today. Um, 
Absolutely love to manage change. Now, uh, being in the financial services industry, but I'm also sure it's topical in other industries that change is now the new norm or now the new constant. And um, I know because I'm currently at the management level and we're constantly looking to hire for skill sets that have this change management capability or experience. So it's no longer a um, specific skill set that only change managers have. It's, it's increasingly becoming a skill set that managers want to see in everybody. So um, adaptability, how do you manage change, irrespective of what level you're at, um, because success in terms of transformational changes at the organizational level largely depend on how individuals at various levels in the organization can adapt um, and harness the impact of change. So, sorry, that's quite broad, but um, the paper was very good. It um, ticked all the boxes in terms of equipping me with the skill set re required to take me to that next higher level and display um, what's required at, at the level I'm operating at. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Nandita. G House, have you done any of the strategizing or leading units as well? Or? Yes, I have um, completed uh, three of the strategizing units and currently doing the sustainable core system. Mm -hmm. um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, to be honest, and very closely related to the work that I do. Um, the, the, the one that stood out for me was the Be Disruptive course, and, and as you mentioned, um, it not only equips you with tools and technologies to look for innovation and come up with new innovation within your industry, but also um, look into business model innovation and re, re refresh and regenerate the way an organization operates through very simple tools, but, but effective. Mm. And I've sort of used that a few times in my, in my current role, so I thought it was quite experienced there. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I'll just quickly touch on the remaining um, specialization. So analyzing, this is about, uh, I guess, two outcomes here mainly. This is understanding the numbers. This is an MBA course um, at the end of the day. And so there is no escaping the numbers. Uh, you need to be able to be a, a proficient in understanding how to read the books. So know your numbers one, I guess the most uh, the, the equivalent is would be management accounting sort of practices and processes. Uh, know your numbers two is more like corporate finance. Um, but I think the interesting thing that our students can expect in, in undertaking these two uh, numbers based units is that we look at the entire landscape. So typically when we look at the MBA um, curriculum, it mainly features on the high end of town, the big end of town, uh, large organizations. But those metrics look very different different when you're looking at a startup or a not-for-profit or a small business. And so we need to understand what metrics matter depending on what type of um, organisation size you're in and, and life, life cycle. The next one is what we call generate insights and this is developing a student's digital literacy or digital capability. So um, understanding how to code, this is not about writing or um, training students in how to write R or Python or anything like that. This is about data science and data visualization. And so the underlying premise or capability here is into understanding the data and so that, that there's baseline understanding of statistics that's required here but then also how to interpret that with meaning um, you must answer that one question that one question is so what what does this mean so that's where um, your ability to generate in strategic insights to add value to the business is that that's the outcome that we're looking for and finally it's know your customers which again is developing your digital literacy and um, again stats is a prerequisite in this one in terms of your foundational level understanding to be able to harness all that wealth of data um, to better understand how our customers behave this is about that predicting outcomes from a consumer behavior perspective and it's all digitally driven these days We've touched on some of the units under the influencing stream and Dita talked about managing change. Indeed, change is the only constant and um, this skill set is required no matter who you are in the organisation. Um, engaging the board is about governance, is about understanding how to mitigate risks, but at the same time as um, promoting an innovative mindset. Communicate with impact. Interestingly, um, I'll share this with you that, you know, and I'll go on to the stackable component but the open component of Communicate with Impact so far is our most popular with over five and a half thousand 
um, open learners interested in this area. I'm not at all surprised with this level of demand because of the environment that we're living in. At the moment, there's a whole bunch of a dissatisfaction, a, a whole bunch of distrust in terms of platforms. I mean, everyone's sort of deactivating their Facebook and, you know, questioning the role of leaders, etc. So what we hear is wanting to search for authenticity and meaning in how we communicate, engage. So this subject takes students through that uh, developing a story that has some meaning behind it and some truth. And then adapting is about personal and pro professional career development. So your career, your life, where are you right now in your career? What lies ahead? How are you going to get there? What is that realization? And what does success look like for you? Um, building personal resilience, I think, is going to be really important no matter where you are. There's mental resilience, is understanding how to deal with failure. Um, and improving yourself always is a constant improving. So here we're tapping into conscious, unconscious bias. We're talking about emotional intelligence. We're talking about developing your cultural intelligence, particularly with becoming a, a global citizen. We live in a global world. We may be broadcasting from Sydney, Australia. Nandita, I know, is joining us from Sydney, um, from near her office right now. G House is dialing in from um, Melbourne, Australia. But we have a global cohort out there. We live in a global and international world. So our ability to connect, to understand the cultural nuances and how that may impact on business relationships is going to be really important. So it will take us develop, it will take, that unit will take you through the importance of understanding cultural elements. So they're the 20 units that you must do before you come into the problem solving capstone, which is really um, going to integrate and synthesize all that knowledge that you've been exposed to in these sort of um, two components. Advise and be curious is about giving students a whole toolkit of frameworks and methodologies in how to solve problems. Um, if we accept that problems come in a topology from very simple, mundane, waterfall type of um, problems, right through to very complex, you know, solving cancer, coming up with wicked sort of problems, really ambiguous things, complex problems. Um, there's approaches and frameworks to guide us in how we attempt to address these problems. Uh, we'll take students through that. Be Curious is really about understanding um, data from um, a research perspective because every single day there's a survey that's released. Survey findings suggest X, Y, Z. But what we're training our students to do is understand what questions to ask to understand the validity and the reliability of that data. And the reason why that is so important is because invariably we're going to make, be making decisions, either financial investment decisions or resource allocation decisions based on those survey findings. So how reliable is that? If the sample size is N equals 50, well, that may not be really representative of what we're looking for. And so therefore we may reallocate our resources and financial commitment elsewhere. So being curious is about invoking that curious mindset to ask the right questions and to understand and be a bit more rigorous in our um, research methodology before we apply ourselves into this immersion, which is about being given a, a challenge from our industry advisory board members or our other industry partners and working on that particular challenge for them. So it's a very applied, immersive or experiential way to, um, to get our students to develop their problem solving capabilities. That's an overview of the curriculum. I'm again going to pause here and ask if there are any questions from our, um, from our audience out there, but also to ask G House um, and Nandita if they've got any comments regarding the relevancy, the currency of the curriculum and how important that was for you in terms of assessing which, which MBA was right for you. So let's start off with Nandita. Um, thanks, Lan. So during my um, search process, I did a few open courses um, for other MBAs and found that some of the reading material was quite dated. For example, we talk about um, Yahoo or, you know, companies that um, are no longer front page news and, uh, and the competitive um, context in which they operated were um, also dated. And so when I was reading through these courses, I challenged um, myself to think that, well, if 
this is the reading material, then is it really preparing me for the future? Is it forward looking? Or is it teaching me skills um, that were re relevant at what point in time? Um, and as I came upon um, Macquarie Uni open courses, um, the contrast was quite stark. Um, so the, the reading material was extremely current to the point that um, there were some courses with uh, reading material that was published just a couple of months prior to reading it. So, um, you know, things like um, I'm currently doing Engage the Board um, and there's reading material from less than a year ago, for example. Um, I also did Manage Change and they talked about leadership and um, some of the images used were or um, talks used were on um, Jacinta Arden and how she's come to the fore in the last you know, few months um, since the Christchurch attacks. So it, it's just the relevance, the recency of the material um, stood out to me and appealed to me and it further lent um, support to the fact that what I'm learning is going to um, equip me with skills for the future. Mm. Thank you very much, Nandita. Good insights. G House? Yeah, thanks, Len. I agree with everything that Nandita said. And just to add to that, I guess the what stood out for me was the, the breadth of the curriculum that GMBO offers and the comprehensiveness. Um, I, I guess it, this is one of the courses which offers a lot, a lot of um, sort of very nice, interesting sort of curriculum. There are very few MBAs who are like 12 courses or 15 courses and you finish off with that. Um, the other bit that stood out for me was the open courses on Coursera. So you can go in and you can have a look. And each of the course is developed as a bite size chunk. So each video, you know, you can see that there, there had been a lot of thought put into developing a video. So each video communicates a, communicates a topic. It's very easy to digest. You know, you can watch a video today, you can watch a video tomorrow and you sort of continue on the journey. So the, I guess the quality of the content is simply superb. And like Nandita, you know, I really enjoyed uh, all the courses I have done so far. Mm. Thanks. I just wanted to build on a couple of things that you both tapped into there. Um, in terms of the open component, I'll take you through that as part of our stackable value proposition. Um, but I do think it is important to talk about the video, um, the way we use videos. So let's just now compare this to a traditional face-to-face -face delivery mode. That way, um, so you are probably attending class. It's usually front-ended by a, a perhaps an hour, two-hour lecture and then um, a seminar. That one or two hour lecture looks like this, a one way delivery with me probably telling you my CV and how great I am. It's really boring for most students. Um, and it's, you know, so what we've done is we've kind of really uh, changed that um, approach, that pedagogic structure, if you like, the learning science behind this. It is harder to actually develop an eight to 10 minute video because what that forces the convener to do is focus on the salient messages. Um, the only thing, the most important messages to share with students. It's much harder to do that than spend two hours talking about myself. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, that format is a very different format to what, we, what we're, we're currently used to. Let me move on now and talk about admissions and pathways. So with the Global MBA, there are two uh, path or two uh, ways that you can get into the degree. One is through the direct admission. And the criteria for that we have listed for this is in fact exactly the same. We all offer um, a face-to-face -face MBA as well, which is very well um, regarded. So the direct admission entry criteria into the Global MBA is exactly the same as what it is for our face-to-face -face MBA. No difference there, so exactly the same criteria. What we do understand, however, is, is that when we're talking about experienced people, professionals, we know that there is going to be a certain percentage of people for whatever reason, one reason or another, that do not meet any one of those direct entry criteria. And yet, they, they present a wealth of experience um, and expertise in where they come from. 
we strongly believe that we should not be denying people, professionals, the opportunity for them to pursue a transformational degree like an MBA. And so hence, we've come up with this thing called a performance track, which is an alternate, <coughs> alternate pathway into the degree. So this is designed for professionals who uh, don't meet uh, one of the, any one of those um, direct entry admission criteria. They can come in through the performance track. The caveat that we've sort of built around this is, is that you must complete at least eight units um, and achieve 65% or higher across um, the eight units and then you'll be automatically enlisted or converted into the direct um, into the degree so they're the two pathways into the program i'm going to say now hand it over to both nandita and g house to talk about their experience to date they've come in through the performance track and, to, and tell me um, what your experience to date has been nandita yeah um okay so basically um i i was um, I qualified for all the, uh, you know, the points required for the direct admission. However, I chose the performance track because it was a slightly easier entry in terms of um, uh, in terms of what was required for uh, the application process. And that's <laughs> I didn't know that. Right. <laughs> well, I do. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and the second point was also because I'm one of those people who really like to try before I buy. So I found the performance track as an easy way to test the waters, do a couple of papers, um, and just assess whether this was indeed the right thing for me. Um, and so that, that was my reasoning for doing the performance track. However, your reasoning could be different. Um, it, this is a great option for people without the bachelors or without um, the supervisory years of experience to get into the MBA. Mm -hmm. um, but those were my reasons. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nadita. I didn't know that that was your situation. But actually, it's a really good point. I mean, you know, with a direct admission um, entry, there is a number of, well, there are a number of different documentation that you have to supply. And, you know, that, that can be a, a little onerous. I, I do accept that. Uh, but your point, Nandita, in terms of you are thinking about the performance track, you just simply have to actually just put, I think, what, put your name there, um, an email address and payment and, 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 and yeah. Was that it? It was simply it was simply a click, which I found way easier. I just given my time and my schedule, and I was like, "Look, this is the easiest way to enter, um, understand what the program is, and if you know if, if things go well and if I like it, I will um, commit to the full thing." And and uh, needless to say, I'm enjoying it, so um, I'm here to stay. <laughs> okay, so I can take from that you got full intentions of um, going and completing the degree, yeah. How about you, G House? Yes, look, um, like I said earlier, having been through that exhaustive process of applying for MBA program and getting, getting the offer but deferring it, I was not motivated to apply for direct admission again. And I saw this performance track entry, which was really attractive. So I said, you know, let's, let's get into to that and see how, see how things pan out after that. Um, so yeah, like every witness did, it was a very easy process, accessible um, process when compared to direct admission. Yeah. Yes, um, yes, that was my. Well, look, that's really good feedback because, you know, we need to take some sort of cues here. I mean, well, obviously we don't want to set these um, unnecessary hurdles and make it challenging for people to do so. But um, as the um, as a provider with um, uh, who has to meet a number of different obligations in relation to the quality framework, uh, we have to have these sort of requirements. So, but I absolutely hear you loud and clear. And this is a lovely way of actually bypassing that, even though that you probably meet all the direct to, um, admission criteria. Yeah, and just to add to that, I guess the, the, the other reason why I selected performance track was initially the threshold was 70% for eight courses. And I said to myself, if I am on this track, I will be, I'll be on to it. I will try and make sure that I at least get 70% in each course. So that's a way of motivating myself. So that was another reason why I joined performance track. Oh, that's a really good insight too. I didn't know that, that, that you put that as a, sort of a, a psychological, you know, a benchmark to a, a achieve. It's a good um, a stretch challenge for you. Thank you for that. Okay, let's move on. And now I'm just going to take you through some of the other aspects of the stackability um, components to it. 
But let me just give you this summary slide in terms of um, the duration. So as Nandita and G has pointed out, you know, um, you can actually take a, a, as many units as you want to, uh, depending on your time commitments, depending on your work schedule and your family obligations. What we do find, we have approximately 120, um, 130 students uh, with us right now. And how they're tracking at the moment is, is that um, they're probably on average taking you know, one to two units a term. We run six terms a year. And so really what that looks like is a 20 month completion um, uh, cycle, typically if you're doing two units a term. So the six terms per year, as I said, you pay as you go. The Australian equivalent is 13.75 per unit. Um, and there are six weeks, we run them in six week blocks with two or three weeks in between each blocks. Moving on to our next slide. And this is really about, whoops, go forward rather than backwards. Here's a really nice summary of what we talk, what we mean when we talk about the stackable and the flexible nature of um, our program. And both Nandita and G has tapped on and touched on the benefit of trying before you buy. So you know, experiencing what this looks like even in an open format. Um, I think G has mentioned earlier that the platform, our LMS, our partner on this one is Coursera. So we deliver the global MBA through the Coursera platform. And because it's through Coursera, and you may not know this, but Coursera is probably one of the world dominant um, platforms when it comes to learning platforms. And um, they're US based. Uh, so Coursera and edX are probably two, the two largest ones in the world with a combined market share of you know over 80 million learners out there. Coursera dominates with uh, just over 45 million learners. Um, they are a startup, however, so they've been in the space for just over eight years and they have really um, cemented um, and are best known for their open courses. Their whole philosophy is a distributed model of education, which we share, and this is about accessibility for everyone. Um, so all of our units are about, with the exception of the problem solving capstone, are available in the open mode for you to try before you buy. In Coursera language, they call it the audit mode. So I would strongly encourage anyone out there considering the Global MBA as what Nindita and G House did was had a look at the open courses just to get a flavour of it. Um, of course, you can get a badge or digital certificate um, if you um, subscribe. I think the, the, it's US $50 for that. You can access um, a bunch of other things there and get the digital badge. So that's in the sort of open module, if you like. Um, students can enrol in a single unit as well, if they want to, with no intentions of going on to complete the degree. Again, that's a single, uh, that's a performance track, single subject entry. And so that is 1375, and that will unlock all the other premium offerings that degree students have available. So for example, you can attend live webinars. There is a weekly live webinar with faculty. This is the same faculty that delivers into our face-to-face -face MBA. Um, there's faculty graded assessments, access to industry speakers, mentoring opportunities, and a whole bunch of other um, material there. As we um, develop our partnerships with leading, uh, leading providers, leading organisations, they unlock a whole bunch of other benefits to our students. At this point in time, I'd like to make an announcement with our SAS. SAS is a, a global data analytics um, organisation. It's US based and they are global. We've got a formal partnership with them. And part of that formal partnership unlocks a whole bunch of benefits to our students. Uh, so people who are working in the IT space, you may be a full stack developer, you may be um, a data scientist, um, architect or whatever, and who are looking for not only achieving and developing their leadership capabilities through uh, an MBA, but are looking at developing professional accreditation through the attainment of, say, data science or data visualisation that is awarded by SAS. Those professional certificates are available to our students at a significantly reduced cost, uh, which is part of the partner benefits. So, you know, I'm really proud to make those sort of benefits available to our um, community. And as we go along, the, a whole bunch of other benefits will be unlocked. 
And then of course, there's a full degree um, that you can go into. So this one slide should really give you a snapshot of the various, how stackable this is for you. At this point in time, I can see that there are a number of questions that have come up and I will address them. So for example, one of the most common questions that we get asked is, you know, if I do the open courses on Coursera, will I get credit into the degree? I'm going to answer that quite simply and say no. The open courses on Coursera, Coursera, you do not get credits. You'll have to actually, to get credits, you actually have to um, enroll in a four credit unit, which is a single course that actually translates through. That is a stackable component to it. I hope that addresses that question clearly. Um, one of the other questions that are coming through is I've done some, oh, I beg your pardon, I've talked about that. How many units do I have to complete to progress um, into the degree? Uh, I think I mentioned at the beginning that if you are entering through the performance track, you will need to complete eight units at 65% or better to be able to then uh, enter into the degree. Um, so that's a minimum of eight units. Um, okay, let's now move on. This is now getting into the how uh, the experience, and this is almost close to the uh, end of this webinar. This is a nice little overview. Each term is six weeks in length. I like to call them six week sprints. What I will manage everyone's expectation on is, is that the intensity of this. So um, at the end of the day, this is a master's level MBA. So when we're talking about master's level, we're talking about level nine in terms of the Australian Quality Framework um, um, process. And so that has a specific level of higher cognition learning. And so I'm not going to mince my words, it is an intense experience. And I will ask Nanita and uh, G has to share their experience of how this six week work blocks, work uh, block works. Because really week one, it's completely, we expect people to uh, be ready at the get go because it starts. Census stage is no different to any other um, provider or institution, but for the Global MBA, it happens in week two. There are typically two assessments for each unit, and they are typically in week three and week six in terms of when they're due. It's completely online through Coursera. Um, as a guideline, it's about 10 to 12 hours of study that you can sort of, um, you should devote per unit. You have to, well, it's not mandatory that you attend a webinar every week. In fact, a lot of people can't make it for various reasons um, and therefore you can pick up the recording. There's an, a different group works and a different assessment types regarding the individual component as well. I'm going to ask our students now, Nandita, to share your experience with some of these elements with people, please. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, like Klan just mentioned, the course or the six week term is indeed quite um, action packed. So, what I found is that the curriculum becomes available or gets unlocked a week before um, the start date. So, that one week gives me um, a huge like opportunity to try to get myself up to speed as much as possible prior to the start of the um, term, especially if I know that during the term I'm going to have certain other commitments um, which will perhaps be behind schedule. So my advice would be to use this time effectively um, as much as possible. Um, the, uh, the assignments, so there are group assignments and prior to doing this course a lot of people said, oh are you sure you want to do an online program, you know, the key um, aspect that you take away from an MBA is is the group learning, the networks you build and the people you meet. Um, and one thing I can say is that we do have group work. Um, one assignment usually out of the two or three assignments you have per course is group work. Um, and you get paired or grouped with people who are um, in geographically similar time zones to you. And that helps because sometimes um, you know, these networks come in handy, um, they're in, this, in a similar region to you, um, and so you can tap on those networks anytime. The other point I'd like to make is that this teamwork and group work is all virtual, um, and 
the work that I do outside of the MBA is now also becoming increasingly virtual. We've got teams, you know, whom we liaise with on a daily basis who are all across the world. Um, remote working is becoming um, an increasingly common feature as well. So the skills you build in terms of group work and asynchronous group work um, is becoming increasingly relevant and you that's something that you can take away or develop in um, the MBA program so we, we use state of, state of the art systems like zoom and and slack which are industry standard and they're quite effective in terms of communicating um, and bringing the team together and it's just something that you start getting better and better at um, and you need to because incidentally these are exactly the same technologies we use at work outside of MBA yeah Great insights. Thanks very much, Nandita. How about you, G House? Yes, yeah, very comprehensive answer, then, Nandita. So, I guess covered a lot of stuff. Um, just to add to that, uh, what, what I would like to mention is everything during the six weeks' time is recorded, um, and you can access the, the content any place, on any device, on any time, which is really great. You know, if you're like me with two, two, two young kids, you know, the kids don't allow you to, to go back to work after going from from uh, work, so you have to wait for them to go to, go to sleep and then start studying. So it's really uh, unique in, in that way that you can um, pick up and do your study any time of the day or, or night. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the stackable model really worked for me. And you, you can think about it this way, you know, people who are who have kids and are listening to this or um, maybe aware of a story called Goldilocks and the Three Bears, people who are not um, aware of the story, it goes like this. It's about a girl who had golden hair, so hence the name Goldilocks. She was traveling in a forest. Um, she got very tired. She came across a house which belonged to three bears. And she was very hungry, so she saw three porridges on, on the table. Um, so she went, she went in, she sort of picked the ball of one porridge and, and started to eat, and she realized this, this porridge is too hot. And she tries another porridge and goes, this porridge is too, too cold. And then she tries the third porridge and goes, this porridge is just right and finish it all up. Now that's exactly what the stackable model of the GMBA allows you to do. You know, you can take four courses, full four courses in one term and go, this workload is too much for me. <laughs> or you can go one course and you can say, you know, this workload is too light for me. And you can adjust, you know, one or two, two or three, depending upon your personal commitment, work commitments. And it doesn't have to be same, same all the time which is quite unique of this GMBA program. And uh, by the way, you know, this, this storytelling, technique, storytelling technique I've learned in the Communicate with Impact course <laughs> last term, so really application of those techniques. Uh, there you go. Uh, you get bonus points for that one, G. How's well done. Thank you very much. I'd like to reframe now how we actually present that value proposition, call it the Goldilocks principle, right? <laughs> Rather than the stack. Well, thanks very much for sharing those. Okay, I'm going to move on because we're um, running out of time and I know that people are very busy and uh, have had long days or are beginning their day right now. This duration overview just gives you um, four different paces, if you like. Um, and here's another analogy. If you're a runner, you know what type of pace that you run. If you're a sprinter and only one, one pace is, is that that's that um, too hot sort of analogy in the Goldilocks example that um, G House referred to, that four units. That is a big load. And, and that is possible if, you know, if, if you want to, if you don't have a life. <laughs> um, it's a really big workload. And I, I will caution people against that. So here's what I would advise people. If you are working full time and, you know, invariably in a fairly demanding role, probably do a, a combination between a light and a steady pace. That's one or one to two units uh, a term. And that should take you about 20, uh, some 20 months to complete. But just a guideline for you. Of course, this is completely up to you and how you want to run it. Uh, a very quick overview of our demographics. We talked about earlier the average age being about 37, um, the average years of experience being 13. Uh, we have a 70 30% split in terms of female male, um, uh, uh, the other way around rather, 70% male, 30% female. That's going to change as we increase um, our size of demographics. Remember, this is, uh, has only gone live since May, May this year. Um, um, I think the other thing that's noteworthy to say is that we have a very cross and diverse sector representation, which is befitting for an MBA as well. So this is welcome to your fellow co cohort if you are thinking of joining the Global MBA. 
Um, Nandita mentioned the industry standard collaboration tools that we have available for our students and they are predominantly through Zoom. We're using Zoom right now. This is, could be a small classroom that we're running right now, right? Um, and also Slack, which is an instantaneous messaging type of um, um, application, which is available for our students as well. Um, okay, so we've come to the end of the, the deck per se. I'm wondering if uh, G House and Andita, if you've got any final comments uh, to share with us, just to wrap up your experience. Um, and remember the people that are listening, uh, you know, have probably have uh, research in which MBA right now. Um, so final comments or um, uh, thoughts for our prospective students. I'm gonna throw it out to G House first. Yeah, thank you, Len, and, and it's been a pleasure, and thank you for the opportunity again to talk to the prospective students. One thing I would like to mention is that if you're thinking of doing MBA, there's great support from the whole team. Like there is a, there is a big team behind this GMBA program, and the lecturers that you talk to are really helpful, and we work with you in your individual areas and help you, you know, transform yourself into whatever you want to be. And that's what Macquarie University's um, value is, that you to the power of us kind of thing. So that's, um, that's really great. And if you're thinking about it, um, you, you're already here. So just take the next step, um, like Nandita or myself, feel free to enroll into program stackable or, or, or performance track entry and see how you go. But unless you know, it's up to you to take that next step. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Mm. Good, thank you very much, G House and Nandita. Um, I'll just leave you with a, a comment that um, my manager made. So I was at this crossroad where I was trying to decide between a technical um, higher education degree and a soft skills degree. Um, and uh, I got a lot of pushback from people who said, you know, MBA was a lot of fluff, was a lot of theory, was, you know, is it really practical in this new age? Um, and the one person I spoke to who was my, who was my current manager, um, made the pivotal impact that led me to applying for this course. And she said one thing, that she said that um, uh, don't call them soft skills, call them power skills, because what these skills or the MBA will equip you with are skills that are going to be most required in the um, uh, in the future generations. So I was looking at data science and, you know, the hard mathematical skills. And she said, well, that's great. But as soon as you graduate, the probability that um, those technologies will um, date is so much higher than the probability that power skills will date. Um, because power skills are here to stay. And um, it is important to keep yourself up to date in terms of other technical skills, but um, what you get from equipping yourself self with power skills is um, going to take you to the next management level, which is what I aspired to anyway. So that was what helped me make my decision. I hope it um, helps you make yours. Yeah, really good um, sage advice from your manager. Uh, I completely agree with that. I, I often talk about this when we do seminars about the future of work and how I conceptualise it is, is that hard skills are soft and soft skills are hard. Uh, basically building on what your manager said to you, Nandita, in that hard skills are easily replaceable and instantly um, disruptive. So by the time that you've learned how to uh, write a few lines of code, um, automation has sit, set in and that makes it redundant. So, you know, it's easy to, it's, it's easier to replace. Whereas soft skills are harder to learn and harder to master and take time because this is when we're talking about collective experience. And this is about talking about how adaptable we are in dealing with this constant stage of change, which is the world that we live in. I'm going to bring this discussion to an end. I know that we've, I hope we've addressed all your questions tonight. If not, I can see there's a few more there, which, but we've run out of time, but that's okay. We're going to come back to you individually um, and address those points there. Of course, this is going to be recorded and we'll be issuing it out to all uh, people who have registered. A special thanks to G House and Andita for devoting an hour of your time uh, this afternoon. I know you've had a long day um, to share with you. Please feel free to contact myself, or any member in the team, if you have any further um, questions. Um, I wish you a very good day or a very good evening and thank you again for uh, listening to the um, Macquarie Business School webinar. Thanks and good evening.